Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hello, my name is Christine Beck, and I am the current Poet Laureate of the town of West Hartford. Welcome to Poetry Around the Town. In case you don't know what a Poet Laureate is, a Poet Laureate is an honorary title and actually it can be bestowed by a town, which is my case. I'm the Poet Laureate of West Hartford. It can be bestowed by a state. Rennie McQuilkin is the current Poet Laureate of the state of Connecticut. Or it can be bestowed by uh, the United States. And we have a United States Poet Laureate as well. Uh, the position changes fairly frequently. And um, so there's a term to the Poet Laureate. And different poets laureate view their job in different ways. Some of us take on a specific project. Uh, some of us view ourselves as ambassadors at large for poetry and the love of poetry. So this program, Poetry Around the Town, is one of the projects that I've taken on because I really want to share with you my love of poetry, a little bit about what I've learned about poetry, and hopefully to debunk some of the resistance or the myths that you may have about poetry. So if you think you don't like poetry, please give me five minutes, and then if you want to turn me off, you can. Um, but I really would like to convince you today that poetry is alive and well in West Hartford. Today I'm going to be talking about poetry about love. And um, this is a very interesting topic. As you can probably imagine, there is a lot of love poetry written. A lot of it is written in the first sweet flush of love. Uh, some of it is fairly predictable and somewhat saccharine and uh, promotes eye rolling in those of us who listen to it. Um, it's not easy to write a love poem. And in fact, uh, Rilke, who was a very famous poet uh, in his famous letters to a young poet said, don't even try to write about love. Don't do it. You're not old enough yet, and you won't write anything that's worth um, anybody else listening to. So there's a lot of warnings that come along with writing love poetry, and yet, and yet, we feel compelled to do it. So we're going to explore uh, today a few famous and perhaps not so famous love poems and kind of see how they work, what makes them work, and perhaps what doesn't. The one I'm going to start with is a poem written by Robert Burns. He was often called Robbie. Uh, he was from Scotland, and he lived from 1759 to 1796. So we're going back in time a little bit. And the title of the poem is, Oh, My Loves Like a Red, Red Rose. So I'm going to read the poem, and then we'll talk a little bit about the significance of this poem in love poetry kind of ever since, I think. Oh, my loves like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my loves like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair art thou, my bonnie lass, so deep in love am I. And I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas go dry. Till all the seas go dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun, I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee well, my only love, and fare thee well a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were 10,000 mile. So a couple of things we can say about this poem. One is that we can say it's a rhyming poem. And of course, rhyming poems were very popular in poetry. It's only really been in fairly recent years that poets have uh, decided 
to get away from rhyme and write what's called um, free verse. And we'll look at some of those a little bit later on. The other thing is I believe we can take this poem at face value. That is to say, its tone is sincere. The poet truly means that he is comparing his love to a red rose, and he's saying that the rose has newly sprung in June. So the image that he's giving us is it's a, it's a new love, it's a fresh love, it's like springtime, and his next line is, oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. All right, so we're to believe that this is sincere. It's a sincere um, homage or a praise to the beloved. And then he goes on and says, I'm going to love you until the seas run dry, which again is a, a very large um, metaphor, but we can see that it does go along with a sincere, you know, I will love you forever. As time goes by, I will continue to love you. Um, and so forth. And if I have to go 10,000 miles to find you, well, that's what I'll do for you, my love. One of the reasons I chose this poem is because it compares love to a red rose. I can't tell you that this is the first poem to compare love to a red rose, but I can definitely tell you it is not the last, right? So if you have gone to buy a Hallmark card for your love, you have probably seen the rose. The rose is very commonly associated with love. In fact, in February, there are going to be a lot of roses sold by uh, people, um, frequently men, but not just men, um, people who want to give flowers to their beloved, and they're going to pick the red rose as the symbol of love, the symbol of passion, the symbol of beauty, etc. So today, I think we can say fairly safely that comparing love to a red rose is a cliche. So what is a cliche? A cliche is a statement that at one point was absolutely true. And in fact, it's still true, but it's been overused. And because it's been overused, it's not fresh anymore. So at the time that Robert Burns wrote this poem, this may have been a very fresh way of comparing love to a rose, but at some point, We've heard it. We've heard it so many times that we have to find a new way of talking about love or else the idea kind of just glides right by us and we don't even notice it. So the next poem I'm going to read you, I'm going to fast forward in time now to the year 1937 and to a poet in, uh, in the US named Dorothy Parker. Dorothy Parker uh, was known for her wit. She was a New Yorker. Uh, some might say for her sarcasm, um, but she was a very uh, 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 erudite and witty poet, and she wrote a poem called One Perfect Rose. So I'm going to kind of tie together Robbie Burns from many, many years before to Dorothy Parker and listen to what she had to say. A single flower he sent me since we met, all tenderly his messenger he chose, deep-hearted, pure, with scented dew still wet, one perfect rose. I knew the language of the floweret, my fragile leaves, it said, his heart enclose. Love long has taken for his amulet one perfect rose. Why is it no one ever sent me yet one perfect limousine, do you suppose? Ah, no. It's always just my luck to get one perfect rose. So what's Dorothy Parker playing with? Well, she's playing with the cliche about the rose, right? And she's saying, well, that's all well and good that you've given me a rose, but I'd like something that's of a little more value to prove your love for me. And she's also playing with the language of the rose, right? So in the poem, she says, my fragile leaf, this is what the rose says, my fragile leaves his heart enclose. Now, that language is not the language of the poet, right? That's the language of the rose, perhaps the rose speaking back at the time of uh, Robbie Burns. So she's making fun of the idea of the rose, and yet, by the time we get to the sec end of the second stanza, we don't know 
that the poem is going to turn in the third stanza to a kind of mm, wry, maybe sarcastic, but certainly witty concept of, I'd rather have a limousine than a rose. And we can take that, I think, as its face value, which is she doesn't, I don't think she really means that, but what she does really mean is that there's something about the rose um, that she's poking fun at, right? And I think it's because the rose has become a bit of a cliche. So I think it's interesting to see how the rose has moved in our culture as a symbol of love. The next poem I'd like to share with you is one of my personal favorites. It's by uh, Shakespeare, who lived from 1564 to 1616, as far as we know. It's Sonnet 29, and it's a sonnet that uh, I have been promising myself for years to memorize. I haven't done it yet, but I will. And by May 3, when I'm inviting all of you to come to the West Hartford Public Library and share a favorite poem, this will be my favorite poem, and I promise you, I will have it memorized. So maybe that's incentive enough to come. I don't know. In any event, this is a, this is a sonnet, and we'll talk a little bit about how the sonnet moves down the page. Um, but it's also a love poem, and there's some interesting elements, I think, to the love poem in this particular sonnet. So here's how it goes. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, haply, I think on thee. And then my state, like to the lark at break of day, arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. So it seems to me that the message of this poem is that we have a narrator who is discontented with his life, um, envious of others, um, and yet when he thinks of the beloved, he says, happily I think on thee, then he remembers that he is in fact rich in love and therefore would not want to change his state with kings. Yes? So that's the turn at the end of the poem. You can see those last two lines are indented. So this is an English sonnet where the last two lines are the turn in the poem. It's a turn of, um, of logic here. So the first part of the sonnet is, I'm unhappy, I'm unhappy, nothing's going my way, I'm envious of everybody else. And then there's this lovely image actually of the lark um, arising from sullen earth. And of course, he's also presenting himself, the narrator, as being rather sullen. And then this beautiful, beautiful line of, for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. One of the things I love about this poem is it really is a narcissist poem, isn't it? I mean, the first almost to the end of the poem is all about the internal state of the narrator. It's not about the beloved at all. In fact, finally at the end, he's awakened out of this narcissistic reverie of how unhappy he is, thinks about the love and decides, I wouldn't want to change my lot with kings. So I think there's a lot that's very interesting that's going on in this poem. And also, of course, it is a sonnet, which means that Shakespeare had to distill down to 16 lines what he really wanted to say. And that is one of the benefits of working with that kind of form. You don't have forever to get to, how shall we say it, the point. Um, I'm going to now read another sonnet, a more modern sonnet. Um, Edna St. Vincent Millay lived from 1892 to 1950. Uh, she actually, Amer an American poet, she actually was more famous in her day than Princess Diana was in hers. She was a performance poet, that is to say she performed live on stages. She came on stage in a large cape. 
um, flowing red hair, and she uh, performed a lot of poetry about love. Her poetry was pretty direct and sensual, so she was, uh, I think, unusual in that, in that way, um, and therefore perhaps somewhat of a celebrity because of that. Um, but this particular sonnet, which I have for you, is What Lips My Lips Have Kissed. What lips my lips have kissed, and where and why, I have forgotten. And what arms have lain under my head till morning, but the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply. And in my heart there stirs a quiet pain for unremembered lads that not again will turn to me at midnight with a cry. Thus in the winter stands the lonely tree, nor knows what birds have vanished one by one, yet knows its boughs more silent than before. I cannot say, what loves have come and gone? I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that in me sings no more. So this is, a, again, I think we're meant to take this in a very sincere way. This is a poet saying, um, I've had so many lovers, I can't remember them all. And I'm now older uh, and perhaps wiser. There are ghosts about that are asking me to remember them, and yet uh, I can't remember them by name. And then she likens herself to a lonely tree in winter, a lonely tree. The birds have vanished, the boughs are silent, and then she turns from the winter to talking about summer. And she says, I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that in me sings no more. So we have a poem here of, I think, real regret, sincere regret. The turn is very different. In this Italian sonnet, the turn takes place in um, the sixth line from the end of the poem, thus in the winter stands the lonely tree. Right? So she's actually turning the poem to a different image. Right? She's actually, she's gone from the, the ghost tapping at the window, and now she's looking out the window, if you will, at the tree, and then she's thinking back to summer. So kind of a heartbreaking sonnet, uh, but I think a very beautiful one um, by Edna St. Vincent Millay. It strikes me that today's poets in writing about love have a much more difficult time because a lot of things that can be said about love have already been said and have been said better than perhaps anybody today could say them. So what's a poet to do? Well, a poet has to find something new, uh, something different. Uh, as Emily Dickinson said, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. So how does a poet come upon the topic of love in a sort of slant way? Now, you could say, I suppose, that, that Dorothy Parker did that in, in talking about wanting a limousine. But I'd like to offer to you one of my favorite poems by Thomas Lux. It's called, I Love You, Sweatheart. I love you, sweatheart. A man risked his life to write the words. A man hung upside down, an idiot friend holding his legs, with spray paint to write the words on a girder 50 feet above a highway. And his beloved driving the next morning to work? His words are not meant to be so unique. Does she recognize his handwriting? Did he hint to her at her doorstep the night before of something special, darling, tomorrow? And did he call her at work, expecting her to faint with delight at his celebration of her, his passion, his risk? She will know I love her now. The world will know my love for her. A man risked his life to write the words. Love is like this at the bone, we hope. Love is like this, sweetheart, all sore and dumb and dangerous, ignited, blessed, 
always, regardless, no exceptions, always in blazing matters like these. Blessed. Now, what Thomas Lux has done is he started in a humorous vein, right, with a, with a fellow who can't spell sweetheart, and he writes, I love you, sweatheart. And we all laugh at that because, of course, that's funny. And he goes down the page imagining what the beloved is going to think when she sees, I love you, sweatheart. And then he turns his poem, this is the Emily Dickinson come at it slant, and he says, love is like this at the bone. We hope love is like this, sweetheart, all sore and dumb and dangerous. And by the end of the poem, the poet, the narrator, has actually invited us to be totally in love, so in love that we would hang over a highway and spray paint, I love you, sweatheart. Because he's completely sincere when he says, always, regardless, no exceptions, always in blazing matters like these, blessed. Now the word blessed going with a poem like this, Thomas Lux took a risk. He took a risk, I think, in writing that at the end of this poem. And I think it works, and it works beautifully, because we're on a ride. We're on a wonderful ride with him. And, um, and we get it, right? We get it that, yeah, mistakes can happen. And hopefully she, she still loves him the next day. The other way we can come at poetry slant is we use a metaphor for the beloved that is not the beloved, but in fact reminds us of the beloved. And, uh, <laughs> and we could do, for example, talk about dogs, which many people do. Uh, Taylor Molly, who is a performance poet, has written a poem, Falling in Love is Like Owning a Dog. He calls it an epithalamion, which you might have to look up. I did. And it means a poem for a bride and a bridegroom. So why don't you enjoy Falling in Love is Like Owning a Dog? <clears throat> First of all, it's a big responsibility, especially in a city like New York. So think long and hard before deciding on love. On the other hand, love gives you a sense of security. When you're walking down the street late at night and you have a leash on love, ain't no one going to mess with you. Because crooks and muggers think love is unpredictable. Who knows what love could do in its own defense. On cold winter nights, love is warm. It lies between you and lives and breathes and makes funny noises. Love wakes you up all hours of the night with its needs. It needs to be fed, so it will grow and stay healthy. Love doesn't like being left alone for long, but come home, and love is always happy to see you. It may break a few things accidentally in its passion for life, but you can never be mad at long for love. Is love good all the time? No, no. Love can be bad. Bad love, bad. Very bad, love. Love makes messes. Love leaves you little surprises here and there. Love needs lots of cleaning up after. Sometimes you just want to get love fixed. Sometimes you want to roll up a piece of newspaper and swat love on the nose. Not so much to cause pain, just to let love know, don't you ever do that again. Sometimes love just wants to go for a nice long walk because love loves exercise. It, it runs you around the block and leaves you panting. It pulls you in several different directions at once or winds around and around you until you're all wound up and can't move. But love makes you meet people wherever you go. People who have nothing in common but love stop and talk to each other on the street. Throw things away and love will bring them back. Again, and again, and again. But most of all, love needs love. Lots of it. And in return, love loves you and never stops. And I'd like to end with a short poem of my own called Eye Contact, this one in the voice of the dog. She wants me to look at her. This is so perplexing. What can I gain by gazing in her eyes? 
Sometimes she takes my head in both her hands, swerves it to her, and waits. I don't know what we're waiting for. She doesn't know I've been up since six, skittered downstairs when he woke, doesn't know I've been fed, let out to poop, that we've been busy pondering the New York Times. But something pulls me back upstairs. I love the curled, round, soft of her, her sleepy smell, last night's Chanel. I love it that she doesn't wash her face. I don't wash mine either. She sees me, pulls me to her, pleased, because she thinks I'm pleased. Even though I'm alone, now that the mutt and poodle left, I don't miss them, but I miss her. Each time she drives off, I think, maybe I should spend more time practicing my eye contact. So here you see a couple of poems where we have dogs epitomizing love. And of course, there are many other poems about an the love of animals and how animals can uh, demonstrate love for us. But this is, I think, what we need when we're looking at how do we come at a love poem in a brand new way? How do we, um, how do we manage to convince um, our audience that we are sincere? And I think in today's poetry, we sometimes have to mix up the sincere with the whimsical, the sincere with the startling, like the I Love You Sweatheart poem, or perhaps even like Dorothy Parker, wanting a love to bring her a limousine. So I hope you've enjoyed some of these poems. Please feel free to contact me through my website if there are any poems you want me to know about. Um, if you have a poem that you're particularly interested in having me discuss on this program, I would be happy to do that. If you have other ideas for types of poetry that you'd like me to talk about, I'm absolutely happy to do that too. This is your program. I am your Poet Laureate. And I hope that you'll be joining me on May 3 at the West Hartford Public Library at 7 p.m. where we will be inviting you to bring a favorite poem, you don't need to memorize it, and then give us one or two sentences about why you love that poem. And if you'd like to get further ideas about that, go to www.favoritepoemproject.org. That was Robert Pinsky's project when he was U.S. Poet Laureate, and he went to Americans and had them write about their favorite poems. You will be not only impressed with the poems, but also with what people had to say about why they loved them. Thank you for being with me. See you next time.